Hi everyone, it's Guillaume from Startup Basecamp. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. During the show, you will have the opportunity to meet the best climate tech founders, investors, and experts from both Silicon Valley and around the globe. They will share with you their stories and personal journeys into this growing and exciting industry, giving you some insight into the ecosystems that help you to take part in the fight against climate change and benefit from the opportunities it can represent. Podcast is divided in two small interviews. During the first part, you will get to know our speakers, their perspectives on the climate crisis and how climate tech is changing the game. The second part of the discussion will be for members of our community who will learn the speaker's secret sauce on how to and share with you their unique expertise on topics such as fundraising, management, strategy and so on to help you to become a better leader in your field. So before we start, I would like to quickly share what we are doing at Startup Basecamp to support climate tech founders in accessing resources and gaining visibility with investors they seek. Our initiatives include a membership-based community platform offering access to a dedicated Slack group with a growing number of founders, experts and investors from around the world and a series of exclusive content such as interviews, weekly job listings, events, and our quarterly online pitch of night opportunity. But more than a place where you can learn, exchange, and grow, we are building a matchmaking service to facilitate connections between our members and top investors and experts in the field. And soon, alongside with other top investors, we will be launching a small fund to co-invest in the growth and acceleration of our members. Finally, all of this is possible because of your support and donations. We are a small self-funded team and we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. So please share one episode with a friend and subscribe to the channels. As an added bonus, we will plant a tree for each of our subscribers each time we reach 1,000 new fans or donors. Do not hesitate to connect with me via social media or email guillaume at Startup Basecamp. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope to get in touch with you soon. And now, let's go for the show. Hi, everyone. During this special episode of Founder Series, we are sitting down with Ben Zoni, Senior Director at the Clintech Open Nordisk Chapter, and four of the finalists from the 2021 program. The Tech Open initiative emerged in 2005 out of the MIT Enterprise Forum and eventually grew over the years until it formally became the Cleantech Open in 2011. They are considered the world's oldest and largest Cleantech accelerator providing entrepreneurs and technologists the resource needed to launch a successful Cleantech company. Its mission is to find, fund and foster entrepreneurs with big ideas to address today's most urgent energy, environmental, and economic challenges. I was excited to host this special episode and learn more about the Cleantech Open and the four incredible entrepreneurs deploying exciting innovations in the fight against climate change. In this episode, following the Cleantech Open introduction from Beth, we will hear from Francesco Benedetti, CEO and co-founder at Osmosis, Osmosis is on a mission to eliminate the energy waste associated with chemical separation by using efficient membrane technology, reducing cost for their customer and carbon emission for the environment. The second founder presenting is Andrew Lee, co-founder at Innovia Geo Corp, which is providing energy efficient geothermal heating and cooling solutions to owners, developers, and other stakeholders involved in the design, construction, and operation of buildings and homes. The third company to pitch is with Tim Gitterman, co-founder at InfiSense, a sensor and software company that provides clean, consistent, and actionable data to the businesses that are solving today's toughest problems, including decarbonization, quantifying sustainability with ESG data, and growing food indoors with higher yields and less resources. Finally, we will hear from Chao Yan, scientist at Princeton University and founder at Princeton New Energy, which develops advanced technologies for recycling lithium-iron batteries based on their extensive IP 
in handling catered and anode materials. Finally, you will learn how you can get involved in the exciting journey deploying innovation in the fight against climate change. Beth, Francesco, Andrew, Tim, ciao, welcome to the show. Hi everyone, welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. We are very happy to have you uh, here with us today for a new episode of our Founders series. So it's going to be a bit special format uh, that you are uh, trying to do for the first time today in collaboration with uh, CleanTech Open Northeast, uh, with Beth uh, Zonis, uh, Senior Program Director, with, uh, who is here with us uh, tonight, and five uh, other uh, finalists of the 2021 uh, program. Uh, so we are super excited and we're going to start uh, uh, directly with, uh, with Beth, uh, if you can give us a 30 second introduction about uh, CleanTech Open Northeast program. Absolutely, and thank you uh, very much, Guillaume, for inviting all of us here. We're super excited to tell you our stories. So CleanTech Open um, is a national accelerator for clean tech startups, and we, um, we oper I run the Northeast region. We are like a mini MBA for clean tech startups. So we essentially help our, our entrepreneurs learn how to be entrepreneurs and build their their skills and learn how, and develop really great connections, learn how to speak with investors, get introductions to lots of different types of investors, including customers, and have all the materials that they need in order to make those first steps to launching their businesses and hopefully with great success and great impact. Okay, so let's go maybe into the into details of the of the program. Can you tell us a bit more about how the program uh, works? What's your thesis behind it? I mean, what do you offer to founders uh, that you seek to invest in or join the program? I mean, who should come to pitch you? That's a really good question. So we tend to work with startups who are very early stage, meaning that they don't typically have any customers yet. So they can be as small as having just two people on a team. And typically they come to us with a solution that has some potential impact for the environment. And um, yeah, and we, we wanna work with people who are solving a real problem that needs to be solved, that can make an impact on the environment and that, um, and that their team is, is a team that we believe can really pull it off and that their solution is something that that will make sense for the the markets that they've at least that they're that they're aiming for so um because we provide a lot of mentorship and we want to make sure that the mentors are also going to get a good experience out of this and when did the program started uh was it like a couple of years ago five years ago ten years ago can you oh, remind well, us a little bit we are we believe we're the oldest and largest accelerator for clean tech startups we started in 2005 as a, an offshoot of from mit there was a group at the mit then then the mit enterprise forum who was putting together this uh this great idea and then in 2006 a similar group was formed in california and in 2011 we merged as clean tech open okay yeah, because I was uh, imagining that with uh, the, the world clean tech and now everybody is saying climate tech, uh, you guys uh, uh, have been on, on the market and supporting uh, founders uh, since way longer than the, the climate tech boom. Uh, and that's uh, super exciting to hear that uh, you, are, you are still there and really pushing the, the ball forward. So in terms of uh, impact, um, you know all of those uh, those companies that you uh, that you select. Do you measure? Uh, do you have any KPI in terms of like uh, how the way or you measure impact? Do you use any uh, process or framework, or do you rely maybe on on scientists or uh, to validate the, the tech and the impact? Uh, is there maybe some criteria in terms of CO2 uh, removed or avoid or maybe social impact? How does it work? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. I love talking about impact. It's one of my favorite topics. So we are measuring impact in a number of ways. We're measuring the impact of, um, of our startups and how well they're doing in the marketplace. And we're able to say happily that 68% of our startups are still in business since 2005. That's a significant number. We have graduated in the Northeast over 500 startups, um, 523 to be exact. 
And if 68% are still going, that's, um, that's a significant number. Um, so how many are still going? How, much, how many people are they employing? Well, last year we were able to measure that, um, determine that they were employing 3,300 people at least, which is a great number. And they had, they had raised over $600 million. So we know that they're making, their, and they had, their revenue was in the range of uh, over um, close to 300 million as a collective. We know the numbers are higher, but these are the numbers that we're able to, to pinpoint in our, in our um, you know, online searches. The other thing that we're measuring, which is something we're super excited about, is how much um, environmental impact they will make. And this year, our startups did a special exercise. First year, we did this pilot on greenhouse gas emissions reduction potential. And we just did a, we just did a project to analyze and put and aggregate all of their results. And I am very pleased to tell you that as a, as a group, they will all, they're all saying together that um, when they're at scale, the 2021 cohort should be reducing in the range of 101 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. That is equal to over 22 million cars. So taking 22 million cars off the road, if you just take our 2021 cohort is quite significant. So we are very excited to, uh, to be able to share that, that information with you. Um, the you other so statistic, there's one more. So the Go other ahead. statistic is about social impact. So we're also working on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we've been uh, steadily in improving in terms of the diversity of our cohorts and others working with us in our ecosystem. And this year's cohort, we're pleased to say, has 62% um, of them have either a woman or a minority or both on their leadership team. Fantastic. So, so that's super exciting. And I, and I think that's, uh, that's really important because, uh, you know, we are living in this new era of, uh, of greenwashing uh, and uh, there's a lot of capital allocated to uh, a lot of like uh, green, clean climate uh, companies. And it's always like the, the, the Achilles, uh, you know, like uh, difficult part uh, to really like see uh, the, uh, the impact uh, that those companies can really have. So congratulations on that. Last question for you uh, before we start with the uh, company and the start of presentation um, you know we uh, all heard and, and overheard about the cop 26 uh, this no deal or medium deal or bad deal that uh, that happened uh, and we all know that uh, we need at least five trillions of investment on a yearly basis up to uh, 2050 to kind of like keep the, the planet under 1.5 degrees or just 1.5 so we start to see all of those uh, change and climate change and catastrophe and wildfire and uh, hurricane. So a lot of people start to be depressed on that, seeing that what's going on, are we doomed? Uh, so what is your opinion uh, regarding uh, climate change in itself? Uh, do you still see hope or do you see that uh, we should uh, probably just uh, you know, invest in a bunker and, and wait and see? <laughs> Well, I guess it can't hurt to invest in a bunker, but I think that what we really need is, is a, a combination of, um, of work on climate resilience, which is one part of it, but also on really ramping up the, the innovations that are coming out of the, out of the gate, like, uh, like at Cleantech Open, and really making sure that they, they get as much traction as possible so we can get to those 101 million metric tons of, um, of CO2 and get that done fast and get it done um, with, with you know, startups and other, uh, other solutions across the globe. So I'm optimistic. I think that we're in a place where the solutions are coming and, uh, and we just need to have more people investing and um, and adopting these these solutions in very short order. Thank you so much. Uh, la last question for you. How can the, the community of uh, investors, founders, and uh, and experts listening to, to the show today can uh, can help you? 
Wow, I would love to talk with um, anybody who's interested. We have opportunities for all of those, all of those types of people and more to participate in our programming. And um, you can sponsor us and help us get bigger. You can, uh, you can be a startup and go through the program. You can um, support startups and encourage them to participate. You can mentor, you can judge, um, you can be an investor. So lots of different ways to get involved and uh, happy to, to speak with anybody who's interested from anywhere around the world. We are currently running mostly virtually probably for next year. So there will be opportunities for people to participate from all over. Fantastic. So I think the, the word is, uh, is out there. So let's, uh, let's start to, uh, to, for the, the second part of the, of the talk today. Uh, we're going to uh, start to uh, have uh, the, each founders who were uh, finalists uh, of the uh, uh, CleanTech Open Nordist um, 2021 uh, program. Um, and the way we uh, decided to structure the, uh, the interview, uh, we're going to all start with a, a quick pitch. Um, so um, each company will introduce themselves, uh, what do they do, the problem they are solving, uh, what are the solutions that they are bringing to the, to the current market that are in today, the stage, and uh, eventually how you guys uh, can uh, help uh, them as well. So we're going to start um, with uh, the first uh, company and the first founders, uh, Francesco, uh, are you here? I'm here. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me, and thanks very much for the introduction, and uh, thanks, thanks for climate. Um, so my name is uh, Francesco Benedetti, and I'm CEO and co-founder at Osmosis. And Osmosis is a clean tech company, and our mission is to transform the way chemical and molecular separations are performed. And uh, we are an MIT and uh, Stanford uh, spin out. Uh, so our co-founders are from these two schools and we've been developing the technology for the past uh, four years uh, with this collaboration. So this is kind of the problem that we're solving like the transforming chemical and molecular separations. And I wanted to highlight why this actually matters and why this is an important problem to solve. It's because the, the cost of unmixing molecules to deliver value to customers nowadays is huge. Uh, and we're talking about uh, more than 15% of world's energy that is wasted on inefficient chemical separations, but also 16% uh, of carbon emissions that depends on the fact we still rely on century old technologies to perform these separations that are really critical to enable the chemical and energy infrastructure. And the reason why these separations today is don't, simply don't work out is because they rely on thermal processes. So it means you need to, really need to boil off components of cool down everything to separate and deliver value or use toxic solvents. So we came up with this idea to use membrane technologies, which is our solution. And uh, we are really focusing on where there's an unmet need and membranes that operate as molecular filters uh, can really make a difference, which is uh, the smallest gas molecules. And this is really a very hard problem to, ch to, to tackle because when you have smallest gas, the smallest gas molecules is very hard to filter them out, like thinking about, you know, a filter like a coffee filter, right? It's easy because you have coffee ground and then you have water, very easy, right? But when you move into gas molecules, it's very, very complicated, but there's huge value in creating something like that. And for instance, we can target a number of markets uh, that are, you know, uh, today already exist and are very established, but also a uh, great projection in the future. So the first market uh, is like existing infrastructure, for instance, uh, traditional and renewable natural gas upgrading uh, that really offers more than 40% uh, of energy uh, today in the United States and, and around the world, and making that process more sustainable, avoiding carbon emissions and methane emissions is very important and we can help with that. Second, uh, pro like second big problem where we can uh, contribute is a transition like decarbonizing uh, all the new uh, industries in particular with the carbon capture powered by oxy fuel combustion uh, uh, solutions, uh, which means that we can uh, really capture CO2 at point source, for instance, the power generation plants, glass manufacturers, steel manufacturers, there's really a lot of applications. But really in the long term, also where we want to help is uh, by um, facilitating uh, a clean energy vector, completely carbon free like hydrogen. And hydrogen is another gas that we can separate very easily, increasingly 
uh, effective separation uh, processes are a bottleneck for hydrogen to become an energy vector that is sustainable. So we want to help uh, with that uh, uh, as well. So this is really this is really what we're doing and kind of the the market that we are uh, that we're that we're tackling. And our okay. stage, uh, we 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 started we we started uh, as I mentioned like uh, three four years ago working on this technology. Uh, we incorporated earlier this year, so we are now transitioning from lab scale to industry scale. And uh, Clean Tech Open really helped us uh, understanding better how to move in this space, and also really helped us in our first round uh, of financing because we just closed a pre-seed round. Uh, there was a $3 million round uh, uh, literally a couple of weeks ago. So now we finally have uh, all the resources to make this happen and to really get started, you know, and, and work on this uh, at, at the next level, the next scale. So what's your first step into the into the market? What's your uh, go-to-market uh, strategy? Because you uh, mentioned that there is different uh, uh, problems and uh, that you can uh, yeah. contribute to solve and, and help. So uh, if you can just share that. Absolutely. So there's already a 5 to 10% of the market in those opportunities that I talked about before that uses membrane technologies, right? So if we, we are going to go to market uh, uh, soon is by replacing existing membrane modules that are already out there, but today don't deliver the performance that would make, uh, you know, membrane technologies actually much better than whatever other alternative technology that uh, is, represents the state of the art today. So by starting by replacing membrane technologies that are already out there, we would not ask customers to change their infrastructure which is a great plus when it comes to adopting a new technology. And by doing so, we would prove value in, uh, in this installation and then quantify better how much we can actually save to customers and how much we can save to the environment in terms of carbon emissions in order to get those market shares that are beyond that 5 10% that is already occupied by membranes, hopefully creating a revolution similar to what happened to you know, uh, in the water desalination space where membranes within the last 10, 15 years replaced distillation and evaporations. We hope to do the same uh, in the gas separation space, uh, starting from where already membranes are used and proving the value. Fantastic. And now that you have, uh, you know, investors, the experience of clean tech open. So what's your, uh, what's your next step? So our next step uh, is uh, hiring talent. They really want to grow the team. And actually we're looking for organic chemists, chemical and process engineers, people with experience in industry and operations uh, and a little bit of business experience. So if you're one of these people, please reach out. We would love to talk to you. We would love to you know, share uh, our vision with you and talk about how we can tackle this problem together and be part of our team. But also uh, we're looking for partners to pilot the, uh, our technology. So if there's any industry partner out there that has uh, issues in gas separation and want to really try something that is a, uh, a breakthrough, really reach out to us and we're happy to pilot. Piloting and scale up is going to be a huge part of the next 18 to 24 months. Fantastic. So where can we find you? You can find us at so uh, our website is osmosis.com, osmosis spelled with an E. And you can write us an email at info at osmosis.com as well. And uh, we're always available and always happy to, to talk to anyone who's interested and shares our vision. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, for sharing uh, everything that you guys are doing. Sounds very exciting and very, uh, very promising. So we're going to uh, move to the, the second company. Um, I think uh, we had uh, Andrew. I don't know if Andrew is here with us. Yep. Fantastic. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Guillaume. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Great. So you, you start to know the, the format. Uh, we're going to ask you to do mm -hmm. a, a quick pitch about, uh, about your company, sure. uh, who you are, where you're from, uh, what's the problem that, uh, that you're solving, uh, which stage you are uh, right now, uh, and what's next for you? Great. Uh, so I'm Andrew Lee, president and co-founder of Anovia Geo. Uh, we're a Canadian company, uh, and our goal is to decarbonize how we heat and cool our buildings. Uh, so if we look at our buildings and homes, the vast majority of energy we use is for heating and cooling. Most of that comes from fossil fuels and the direct burning of fossil fuels. So we're really to tackle and change that. 
Uh, and we're doing so by focusing on uh, finding innovative ways to substantially bring down the cost of installing a clean and efficient geothermal heating and cooling system. Uh, so geothermal is a well-known technology. It's been in decades, uh, but the existing ways to install the systems are, are very expensive. So the typical baybacks can be in excess of 10 years or even more. Um, so our goal is to really substantially make that uh, payback uh, a lot sooner uh, to make the economic case for heat, uh, geothermal heating cooling systems uh, you know, that much more uh, better. Uh, so our first product that's ready for market are our geopiles. Uh, and what they do is they integrate geothermal functionality directly into steel foundation piles. So you can get your foundation to end your geothermal system together in one element going in the ground. Uh, so we're piggybacking off of the infrastructure that already goes in when building a building uh, and getting your geothermal system uh, together with it. Uh, and so we currently installed our, our first full-scale uh, geopile pilot system. Uh, and it's been up and running for about 10 months. Uh, so we're just about getting ready to start our, uh, our uh, winter season uh, testing on that system. Uh, and so for next steps, we're looking to implement commercial scale pilot projects next year. So what was the, the, the lessons learned from that, uh, that pilot? Uh, what did you guys uh, uh, take out of that? <laughs> well, the uh, so and the opportunity. Was installed, yeah, so in, it was installed in Canada in February, uh, just because of timing of things. So I would uh, recommend not having to do that in the middle of February, but uh, I think we were uh, delayed a little bit with COVID. So wanting to get it in the ground as, as soon as we were able to. Um, so I, I'd, I'd say, uh, you know, <laughs> when it's not, uh, you know, the middle of winter outside, the better. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, the, the first pilot is, uh, is running and uh, you probably were digging into the uh, frozen, frozen uh, soil, so it <laughs> might have been uh, challenging for you, but uh, uh, where is your um, market target uh, right now? Are you uh, targeting... Uh, Canada, <clears throat> excuse me, like uh, US, maybe Europe, uh, who is your first, uh, I mean, who and where is your first uh, step maybe? Yeah, so we're initially targeting um, low rise uh, residential or commercial structures uh, that use steel pile foundations. So uh, we're working with foundation contractors that install uh, steel pile foundations uh, so that we can build up, uh, you know, a networking capability of contractors we can work with to install the systems. Um, initially, uh, you know, we're targeting uh, first projects in our home market of, of Canada, uh, but also beginning to look uh, abroad into the Northeast. So through CTO, we were able to make some great connections into the Northeast uh, region in particular. Uh, and also we've uh, assigned an agreement with a, a, a partner uh, for the European market. So we're in the process now of just working with that partner to evaluate uh, the European market and look for uh, sort of the, the most appropriate uh, countries and markets to enter. So that's something mm -hmm. that uh, we're pretty excited about. So just in terms of uh, economics, uh, do you have any data or like, uh, I guess after this, uh, this was pilot, like uh, a better understanding of like how um, much I mean, cheaper are you guys compared to a traditional uh, system? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, our, our target is to be half the cost or better uh, of a conventional geo system uh, and so in doing so we'd be able to make that payback go from greater than 10 years uh, to potentially less than five years uh, so that's the objective with the, the technology we're still in the process of kind of get, getting to scale uh, kind of beyond the pilot um, but working with uh, you know industry contractors you know existing foundation contractors mechanical contractors to just get the processes uh, in place uh, to be able to install systems at at scale. Okay. And how was your experience with the Clitec uh, open program? Uh, it was great for us. You know, we had a group of four mentors. Uh, we met with them on a weekly basis. Uh, and for us, it really helped uh, hone our plans out. You know, I, I would say that uh, prior to the program, we were probably a little bit disjointed and trying to maybe um, kind of focus on, on too many things at once. Um, so it really helped us, you know, focus in on, on what we should be focused on uh, and the direction we should be uh, pursuing with the business. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed, um, you know, the structured nature of the program as well. Um, so it really was a, you know, defined modules every week that we had to get through, but um, it really forced 
helps us to, to kind of do the deep thinking on all aspects of the business um, to be able to uh, to generate and, and get to uh, building a, a you know credible business plan. Okay, and um, what's uh, what's next after the program for you guys? I mean, it's just finished now. Uh, what's your uh, what's your next steps? Are you uh, currently fundraising? Are you uh, seeking to to grow, hire new pilots? What's uh, what's next? Yeah, I guess all of the above. So uh, we're <laughs> yeah, we're getting ready to uh, to go out to look for a seed round early next year. So uh, just in the planning processes there and, and reaching out to investors and making um, you know first contacts with them uh, to get on their radar. Uh, so any uh, potential investors that might be listening would be great to connect and, and share what we're doing. Uh, we're also looking uh, to do commercial scale pilots next year. So uh, I was just on a call with a a, a pile contractor and he's building a, a, a cottage and said, hey, this this would be pretty cool for my cottage. So, um, you know, anyone that's out there that's uh, using steel piles uh, in a build, building, you know, we'd be happy to work with you to help get a, a clean and efficient geothermal heating and cooling system out of it as well. Fantastic. So I guess that's uh, how the community uh, can, can help you. Anything else? Great. Uh, no, I, I think that's everything. It's, it's been a pleasure. Fantastic. So where can we find you? Uh, yeah, at our website, so uh, www.anoviageo.com. Uh, it's Anovia with two N's. Um, so you can find us there. Uh, and then if you've got any questions, uh, just use the submission form and, and we'll, uh, we'll get back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. So uh, let's go with, uh, with Tim. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Fantastic. Hi, Tim. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. All right. Yeah. So I'll just, just, you want me to just jump right in? Just jump, jump, jump right in. I mean, like, uh, I think you, you know the format and uh, it's so that uh, you, you, you get, uh, you're ready and prepared. So uh, let's go for it. Sure. All right. Yeah. So I am Tim Gitterman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Infosense. And I, to understand how we got started, let me just tell a simple story. So imagine me 15 years ago, a building systems engineer standing on the rooftop of a store, you know, of a building. And my job is to see if the HVAC systems are working correctly and, and identify ways to save energy. And, you know, it's are the systems heating and cooling like they were designed to do? Is the building operating efficiently? Is it wasting energy? That's that's my job. And I'm placing sensors. Uh, my fellow geeks and I prefer to call them data loggers, but I'm placing these in each of the HVAC systems in every corner of the building and in many of the spaces. And you know, I use handheld meters to record all these readings on my clipboard so I can then enter them into a high tech Excel spreadsheet. And the full implementation takes days and sometimes even weeks for one building. And we did this for hundreds of buildings. So six months later, I'm back at that building on the rooftop, but this time I'm, I'm picking up those data loggers and I'm putting them into a sandwich bag, you know, an, another high tech process currently happening. And some sensors, now they're on the ground, some are useless, some are cracked from weather, some have smiley faces drawn on them with Sharpies, and some just got flown away by crows. Life happens. So great, I don't even have all the data that I need. And so I retrieve hundreds of these data loggers and then I download them into a computer and that raw data goes into my color coded Excel sheet where we'll now employ data analysts to help decipher that data. And the conclusion that the HVAC systems are not working properly, but the store is wasting money. And somehow our clients and, and my boss would never seemed to appreciate learning that nine months later. Now, the real reason I'm doing this work is because buildings represent 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And when someone like me in my field of engineering looks at a building, we don't see skyscrapers made of cement, we see waste and we see opportunity. And the challenge is that to do this hard work, to ensure smarter buildings and a healthier planet, we need lots and lots of data and we need it now, but this data has been hard to get gritty, incomplete, and unreliable. So flash forward to now, InfoSense is changing how data is captured, analyzed, and monetized so we can tackle some of the world's most pressing problems. And with InfoSense, I could have gotten the data I needed from those spaces and those systems in minutes. 
So our long range, low power wireless tech makes this real time data accessible anywhere on the planet. And we provide an easy way to just grab it and use it for a variety of applications. So the expert engineers, analysts, the software companies that are making our buildings smarter and more sustainable can focus on what they do best, finally. Now we've achieved early stage success and we've pilot piloted this in nearly 600 sites throughout North America. We're now raising funds to grow our team, uh, improve our product and position ourselves to be a strategic partner to the leading firms that are tackling these problems on a global scale. And we're going to power them with data. So what kind of data are you uh, capturing? Uh, maybe I, I skipped that part, but uh, if you can go a little bit more in detail, so like, uh, Well, what are the data that are interesting uh, your, your, your client and, uh, and, and, and you know, property uh, manager, yeah, so, builders, uh, uh, so landlords? Oh, sure, sure. We leverage this open ecosystem of wireless sensors and we really can monitor almost everything. And it really boils down into two categories, environmental stuff, you know, air, light, temperature, humidity, CO2, and, 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 stuff, and things like uh, the energy use of an equipment or, um, or, or an HVAC system. And to put that into a few like, use cases, some of the most common use cases we see right now driving our work are uh, monitoring assets for operational effectiveness. So equipment like HVAC systems or other uh, equipment inside of buildings. And they need to monitor Are they on and off? Are they on and off at the right times? Are they running too much? Are they running inefficiently? How much energy are they using? That can be done by sometimes one or just two sensors. Um, and then uh, uh, and then also they're monitoring the air quality. Are they uh, are they reaching the temperatures they should or not? So these are you know temperature and humidity sensors. Are they bringing in enough fresh air? Those kinds of parameters. Another really um, uh, powerful use case happening right now is around environmental, social, and governance reporting, so ESG. And that's driving uh, benchmarking and understanding of the energy use and carbon emissions from our facilities and buildings. And so we make it very easy to get what's otherwise hard to get data from gas meters, electric meters, uh, water, uh, water meters, and, and so on. So how does it work? Like, do you have like uh, one little box with all the, the, the sensors or do you have like a variety of different little boxes with sensors? I mean, I guess you don't put them in a, in a sandwich bag anymore, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, but how different it is from, from before? Yeah, so we so the the technology we use is called LoRa, and it's really a revolutionary technology. Uh, there's it's an open ecosystem, so it's not proprietary, not locked into one vendor. And there's a range of sensors that do a range. Their devices some have seven, eight, ten sensors in them. Some have one or two specific things, but they really range. And we uh, we can leverage any of these made by leading manufacturers around the world. Um, and LoRa is just on another sort of planet, so to speak. It can communicate from a sensor to a single hub over miles. So five, 10, sometimes more miles outdoors, which means it can punch through walls and floors inside of buildings from rooftops to basements and everywhere in between without littering the building with repeater hardware. Um, so great communication uh, a strength. And, um, and then it has long battery life. So these sensors can last for three, five, seven, 10 years, depending on how often you report data. And you can do it all while completely independent of a local IT network. So there's no need to come into a building and be a security threat or use that. And all those things combined make it a real super powered technology that is different than the other technologies that have come before it. Mm -hmm. So who's who is doing that? Because I mean, I guess if Laura, as you mentioned, uh, is not something that you guys build, uh, so I guess uh, other companies can use it. Or what's the defensibility that you have regarding that uh, uh, what, what positioning it, uh, on the market? That, that's right. Well, it's 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 the wild west, and it and it it takes an extreme amount of heavy lifting. So just like Twilio helps business and apps take put text messaging into their technology, into their apps. They navigate this complex tech telco ecosystem to deliver a text message. Uh, or Stripe takes a complex kind of payments and credit card ecosystem and delivers it at one place. That's what we do. We deliver all of our technology in one API. So all these sensors, all these data, all the command and control back and forth, the configuration, there is an extreme amount of heavy lifting that goes and our customers can just use these sensors Mm -hmm. data in an API, flexible to use it in any application. So it's a very modern, 
uh, approach and we enrich all that data and focus it on very specific solutions. So that's exciting. And uh, what I mean, you, you mentioned that you have been you have been deploying that in six hundred uh, different right. location. Uh, so what did you learn from that, and uh, what's next for you guys now? Yeah, well, the great thing is we've already blown everything up, right? We've made all the mistakes. <laughs> we've learned how all of this works. We 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 are uh, experts in this space. And we have the, the great thing about being an API first company is you get to see how your customers use your data because we're really a data company leveraging this wireless sensors. We have to get this data from the real world to solve these problems. And what we've seen is customers do certain use cases and face certain common challenges. And so we've developed solutions around this HVAC and ESG reporting that we've seen customers do over and over again. And that allows us to package those and product market those in a specific way to the people who most need them, as well as kind of move up the stack a little bit and offer solutions that expand our addressable markets. And so we're taking all those learnings, talking to some of the largest multinational strategic partners who struggle to get this data from the facilities they work with and are helping you know, power them and power their software platforms with, uh, with this real world data. Exciting. So how was the, the program for you uh, with the CleanTech Open? I thought the program was great. I mean, with the, the work you have to do, you really have to be prepared. You really have to put in the effort to do it. But we got a lot out of that. And our mentors were, were fantastic. We just had a diverse group of perspectives and backgrounds, and they all really complemented each other really well. And I got way more out of that than I expected. Um, and then, you know, finally, like we just underestimated ourselves. Uh, I thought that the only thing recognized in CleanTech Open would be companies that have this box that plugs in with this many gigawatts of carbon out. And we're a little different because we're enabling the decarbonization effort has to have data behind it. And we enable that. Um, but we were able to pitch into the regional finals here with my colleagues on the phone, on the, the call. And then we made it all the way to the national finals. And so it was a, it was a great lesson to learn. Fantastic. So uh, how, do, how can the, the community of uh, investors, experts, uh, founders can, uh, can help you? Sure. Well, first, I just encourage folks to take a moment and acknowledge like, how much of your life has been digitized already. Right? If you look around, shopping, marketing, dating, banking, currency, even art. And so then take a look at the world around you, the, the spaces, the systems, the air, the buildings. I mean, that's the next frontier. That's what InfoSense is doing. We're literally digitizing the world around us. And listeners can ask themselves, you know, how can we demand healthier and safer air if we don't actually measure the air quality? How can we demand zero carbon buildings if we don't monitor everything happening in those spaces? So the first way folks can help us is actually by demanding evidence-based actions and policies supported by real world data. And then InfoSense will go out and get that data and power those solutions. But the second way is to help us matching us with businesses that need this data. Everyone knows a business says, I could use those sensors, I could use that data. Uh, and, and we're raising uh, a seed round. So any investors that want to support companies that are actually tacking, tackling real world problems, we'd love to talk to them. Exciting. So where can we find you? Yeah, www.infasense.com. It's I-N-F-I sense.com. Uh, and we're all over LinkedIn. So you can find us anywhere there and uh, growing presence on Twitter as well. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your presentation and congratulations of uh, everything that you're doing. So, all right, uh, guys, so let's move on with uh, our last uh, entrepreneurs, uh, which is uh, uh, Chow. Yeah. Am I pronouncing it right? That's very right. <laughs> Just <a> Chow. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I mean, you know the you know the format. You already heard uh, and listened the, the last uh, four uh, pitches. So uh, when you're ready, let's go for it. Yeah, very happy that tonight I can join here. Actually, this afternoon in New Jersey. Uh, yeah, my name is Chow, and uh, and I'm the CEO and also founder of Princeton New Energy. So Princeton New Energy is a spin out a startup from Princeton University. So all the four co-founders, all the Princeton researchers and also faculty members. So our mission is to find a cleaner, faster, and a more sustainable solution to deal with the uh, uh, waste lithium ion battery to recycle them. So we develop a technology from Princeton University and we license them to the company and to work with them right now. And uh, I think uh, to answer why uh, we are working with the lithium ion battery, we have to 
uh, starting about the list on um, battery market and also the EV market. So we know that everyone wants to reduce the emissions today. So that's why we want to uh, use the EV car uh, instead of the uh, uh, gasoline car, which can reduce the emissions, which is great. And you can see the, the EV market the last year in 2020 is about uh, 2 million per year globally. And this number going to increase more than 10 times to 2030. And this is a very good, but also give us a lot of a challenge. First one is a supply challenge. We need a lot of lithium batteries. And also we need a lot of the materials to build the batteries. And also the battery has a lifetime, like five years, 10 years. So after the end of life, how we deal with them? So with those challenges, so that's why the recycling of lithium batteries is important. So then what is technology different from us with the, the current technology? The current technology called the hydrometallurgical technology, which is using for hundreds of years to recycle the, the, the rare metals like the gold or silver, uh, which is a very traditional method. So to recycle those metals, they have to use a strong acid, a lot of acid, thousands of tons of meth, uh, uh, acid to dissolve the batteries and then to extract all the elements from those uh, liquids. Therefore, they require a lot of the, uh, the energy and also generate a lot of waste. So our technology, we don't want to break the cathode materials inside of the batteries. We want to separate the cathode materials out and using plasma to clean the cathode materials and then to regenerate those cathode materials to the battery grid materials. So that's why we are able to reduce CO2 greenhouse gas emission about 80% and water use about 70%. And also the energy use reduction is about 80%. Those great uh, advantage can help our technology to win the market. And the most exciting about our stage is that uh, p right now is working with Wistron, which is a big company about the pilot project. And we are building 500 tons uh, the the pilot line in Dallas today, which is uh, very exciting right now. So yeah, this is a basic introduction about our company. Fantastic. So wait, tell me a bit more. I mean, is it um, the, the way you are like? I mean, the new process that you uh, you guys put uh, put in place. Uh, is it also applicable for uh, any mobile phone uh, batteries, or is it only for EVs uh, batteries because they are larger and there is more cells and maybe it's easier to uh, recycle? Or do you guys see that uh, there is a potential that you already tested uh, in that sense too? Yeah, in the lab scale, we have tested all type of the lithium batteries. No matter your laptop batteries or electronic devices battery or the EV batteries, they have a different chemicals. And the most famous like a lithium cobalt oxide, yeah. lithium ion phosphate or NCM, NCM materials. So in the pallets, we are focusing on the electronic devices battery and the EV battery together. So that's why we can service our customer uh, today with uh, those electronic devices and uh, tomorrow EV markets. Okay, fantastic. And um, how is your, your competition today? Um, I mean, you mentioned that uh, you guys are completely using a different uh, different process and way to do it. And I'm not a, uh, an engineer, neither a chemical engineer, so I won't be able to, uh, to dig deeper into, into that sense. But compared to them, um, how, um, I would say, cheaper and faster are you uh, compared to the, the traditional, uh, you know, uh, existing solution that are uh, recycling uh, those batteries? Sure. The traditional method, they need to recycle the batteries and then to send their recycled raw materials to the second infrastructure to rebuild the cast of the materials. So that's why they are long time, at least one week time. So in the process are able to recycle those materials from cathode to cathode within two days and uh, reduce the cost at least a 30 to 40% compared with traditional method. So that is what we can bring to uh, here on top of the uh, sustainable parameters. Okay. And so you mentioned that uh, you're building, if I uh, understood you well, like a, a plant in Dallas right now to, uh, to scale the operation, correct? Yeah, I think this is the most exciting thing that uh, well, we are not uh, uh, have this plan in the uh, slides or uh, or just some idea. We are working with a Fortune 500 company, Wistron, and we are building this pilot line in Dallas in the factory. And uh, this uh, this pilot line will uh, start operation in the first quarter 2022. 
So just a few months ahead, and uh, everyone will, will able to see this pilot. Okay. And uh, how, how scalable is your uh, is your potential uh, uh, pilot? How, how long is it going to take to go uh, at full scale for what? What are yeah. the next steps in your in your roadmap? This is a very important thing and a very important question. So uh, from the pilot scale, we are 500 tons per year pilot, uh, pilot line, and we are able to re scale up to 20,000 20, tons per year capacity after the pilot line. So uh, the pilot line will run six months, and after that, we'll build the next full scale the, the, the production line. OK, exciting. So how was the, how was the program for you, uh, the CleanTech Open? I'm sorry. What did you learn uh, during the program? Why did you join uh, CleanTech oh. Open? Oh, the CleanTech Open actually is a, uh, is a great uh, platform. And so we have great uh, the, uh, the, the mentors and also great judges. We get a lot of uh, uh, support uh, from the financial part, from technology part, and also to uh, introduce us to the, uh, the potential customer a lot. So I think during the very intense the three to four months, we did a lot of homework, but uh, which is very useful in order to 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 get a final pitch deck and also to reach out to our uh, customers. Very helpful. <laughs> Fantastic. So what's uh, what's next? I mean, like, how can the the, the community of uh, of listeners can uh, help you today? Yeah, I I, I think uh, uh, for the for the next step, uh, I think I'm still working with uh, my mentor from Clean Tech Open, which are very helpful for sure. And in the future, we hope we can also uh, to support ClinTech Open and um, uh, to work together. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you so much, guys. It was uh, super uh, inspiring and exciting to, to hear from you. Uh, thank you to, uh, to, to Beth as well. Thank you so much. Uh, for all of those uh, exciting projects uh, that you're all working on. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of uh, potential uh, and we're excited to uh, follow up with you uh, guys in a in few months to see uh, how, how far you, you go and how we can uh, we can help you. Uh, and I'm very excited to see uh, you know so many brilliant people like, uh, like you putting so much effort uh, to move the ball towards a, a better and cleaner world. So thank you so much. Hi, it's Guillaume again. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. As I said, do not hesitate to share an episode with a friend. Also, if you value the work we do for the climate tech ecosystem, here is how you can contribute to it. Today, I'm asking for your support and a donation or sponsorship to make the work of our self-funded team more viable. Even a small contribution means a lot to us. In any case, I will invite you to subscribe to our channels and visit our website startupbasecamp.org to discover more episodes like this one and get your membership to access all our members' exclusive content. So remember, all of this is possible because of your support and donation. And we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. Let's keep in touch and I hope you will enjoy our next show with us.